Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you all for attending this deep dive about Sonoma Mountain and the geologic and climactic evolution with Nicole Myers. Uh, my name is Nicola Michael, and I am an outreach assistant with the Center for Environmental Inquiry. Our public events are usually done either through our Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain in Penn Grove or our Galbraith Preserve near Yorkville in Mendocino. And though we are feeling the shelter in place like you all, we are happy to be able to reach people during this difficult time and connect in new ways. Uh, before I let Nicole take it away, I want to tell you a little bit about what the Center for Environmental Inquiry is and um, how it can be a resource to, to all of you, uh, no matter whether you're a, a Sonoma State student or affiliated with uh, Sonoma State, whether you're um, a parent, a government employee, educator, member of the public, or an organization in need of environmental solutions. Um, the center envisions a North Bay. Hi. Now we need to together. Class. Oh, hello. Um, let's see. I'm gonna mute one more. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, the center envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions and invites you all to get environmentally ready with us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors um, of society by providing hands-on understanding of our connection with nature and skill building experiences um, that can help um, create sustainable solutions. So we are trying to help people become aware and prepared and engaged um, for a very awake society. There are many ways to get involved with us. You can engage in research, um, be in a naturalist or land management training program, an internship or student job, attend an event like this, um, access our data, lead or contribute to an event, uh, or partner with us on projects. You are important in addressing the greatest environmental challenges in history, and engaged society is critical and diversity is critical. Very important. So today, we're going to focus on Sonoma Mountain and discover how it's formed. On our geologic exploration, we will look at how tectonic plates, uh, tectonics and seismic and volcanic events shape our world. Um, this event is in our deep dive format that consists of a live presentation with a Q&A segment. Okay, let's see. Um, so today we'll spend about 45 minutes hearing from Nicole Myers, and then 10 to 15 minutes on our Q&A section um, at the end. So I think almost everyone is muted, so thank you all for muting yourself and, and stuff. And so please, okay, sorry. Okay, so at this time, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so please use the chat box for any pressing questions or comments, such as, such as if you can't see or hear the presenter, Nicole will not be reading the chat box right now until the end of her presentation but I will be monitoring it. So feel free to type in questions that come up that you'd like her to address at the end. Um, I think since we have a lot of people, I will be um, turning everyone's video um, off so that um, it's easier to hear. So I will do that in a second. Um, now that I think everyone is here, I'm going to ask you all to please type your name into the chat box right now. Um, this will be our sign-in sheet for the day, and since sometimes the Zoom usernames aren't the same as the name you registered under, um, it really helps. So I would really appreciate it right now. The chat box is in the bottom, um, the bottom like black bar where it says chat, and I see a lot of you are putting your names in. That looks great. Thank you, everyone. Um, awesome. And while you're down there in the comment section, in the um, chat box, um, can you please type how you heard about this event? So I think Nicole, can you put on the next slide? So can you, um, you know, think about how you heard about this event and put, you can put in the number that corresponds with the, um, the way that you heard the event right now as well. Oh, great. Thanks everyone. Looks really great. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so now at this time, I'm very happy to introduce 
Nicole Myers, a lecturer with the Department of Geography, Environment, and Planning at Sonoma State University. So thank you, Nicole. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so excited that I actually get to present this today and I recognize so many of your names and faces. So good to see you again, even if it is very remotely. Um, so again, if you haven't already, if you would add to the chat box how you heard about today's presentation and just to simplify it for their records. Um, I put it in this format so that if you type the number one into the chat box, then we know that you heard about this presentation via an email from the Center of Environmental Inquiry. If you happen to be one of my spring 2020 geology students, you can type in number four, and then we know that. And hopefully a number of you um, also heard about this from my Appreciating Earth newsletter, which I'll talk a little bit more about at the end of the lecture, end of the lecture, the presentation, um, and that would be number three. So if you have technical problems, please do write it in the chat box. We can't really promise to solve them for you, but at least we can do what we can. And again, Nicolette will be managing that for me. So I am gonna go back to the intro slide because what I really am focusing on today is the formation of Sonoma Mountain, but this really could be a presentation about the formation of Sonoma County. By focusing in on Sonoma Mountain, I'm just trying to provide all of us a way to really consider how this one very small piece of land has formed over the course of 180 million years. If you just heard 180 million years and your brain just kind of exploded, then welcome to the world of geology. 180 million years isn't actually that long of a span of time when we consider that the earth is 4.56 billion or 4,560 million years old. We are just going to be focusing on a very small part of that and I will be focusing on how Sonoma Mountain as we know it today has evolved. So where do I start? Because this is this is a lot to try to put this all into one presentation. Well, today I'm going to start with geologic terrains. So here on this map on the left hand side, we have what we call a ge geologic terrain of California map. Now a geologic terrain is our way in earth sciences of looking at the compilation of rock formation tectonic processes, which I'll give you an intro to here in a moment, and the climactic record. So it's kind of a big picture overview of how did rocks in this region form. Oops, tech problem there, okay. So when we consider geologic terrains, essentially these are surface areas of shared geologic origin. So when we see a pattern, for example, in the area we live here, we see these diagonal lines going from top, upper left down to bottom right. And we can match that and say that this terrain is an oceanic terrain. We can also see that other terrains might be called cover terrain. So that's where I'm gonna start with today is really trying to understand the formation of our area of the world as a combination of oceanic terrain, as in terrain or rocks that formed in an oceanic setting, and later cover terrain, which is terrains that formed in a continental setting, which is of course where you and I live today, it'd be very difficult for us to live on the bottom of the ocean. An important aspect of understanding the difference between continental settings and oceanic settings is understanding plate tectonics. Unfortunately, I do not have time to go into all the nitty gritty of plate tectonics today, but at least I can give you a bit of a intro to it. So plate tectonics is essentially a theory that looks at how the surface of the earth is broken into plates or segments that move relative to each other. Simply, those segments can pull apart from each other, divergence, they can come together, convergence, or they can slide past each other, and we call that transform movements. I'm going to show a very short video that does a miraculously good job of giving you an idea of how this process takes place. It happens because hot rock rises, heated by the Earth's core. Near the surface, the rock spreads in two directions and goes sideways. 
it begins to lose heat. Eventually, the much cooler rock sinks back down. Through this spreading process, the Earth's crust is very slowly dragged apart. And it's this that ultimately causes the continents to move. Where the plates collide, the rock on the seafloor containing carbon from the dead plankton is carried deep into the Earth. As it descends, this layer of rock is heated, so the rock melts, releasing carbon dioxide. And gas is returned back into the atmosphere during an eruption. cycle is complete. Very short and sweet little video there that gives you a sense of how plates pull apart from each other. Again, that's called divergence, like to become two for die, and then how plates come together, which is convergence. Oops. Wow, that video really just wants to keep playing. Okay, so first we're going to focus on the marine setting. So we saw in that video that underneath the ocean, two plates pull apart from each other, what we call divergence. And that mostly, not completely, but mostly occurs underneath the surface of the ocean. So marine setting is any place on Earth beneath the waves where we see materials, for example, mud and sand and rocks and other pebbles that are accumulating, forming within the marine setting. This also includes volcanism. We get a lot of volcanic eruptions underground or under the water. And this is important because you can see that you and I here, we live in a setting that is made out of oceanic terrain. It is under the heading of accretionary terrain. So I need to pause for a moment and just define what accretionary means for those of us who are first hearing this. So to accrete something means to add small things together, they combine into something bigger. For example, if you were cleaning the lint out of your dryer and you take a small piece of lint and you roll it around in your lint catcher, it accretes together and you end up with a larger ball of lint that is the combination of smaller pieces of lint that have been accreted together. So accreted terrains are quite literally terrains that formed elsewhere, rocks that formed elsewhere that have come together and been combined together in a specific process. So we're gonna have to focus on oceanic for sure. And then we also need to consider that some of the area just below Sonoma Mountain where many of us live is also considered cover terrain. Now cover terrain forms in a continental setting. So not in the ocean. It is associated therefore with continental tectonic plates. So now we have a starting point. We can look at these two different kinds of terrains and how they form Sonoma Mountain. And here we have Sonoma Mountain right here. You can see right on the interface between those two terrains. So what I have done is I have taken the story of the formation of Sonoma Mountain, 180 million year long story, and I'm simply dividing it into three chapters. Chapter one looks at how the oldest rocks in Sonoma County of Sonoma Mountain formed in the marine formation, the marine setting in the ocean. Then chapter two is going to be looking at the transition from marine to continental. And I'm quite sure you're not that surprised to find out that our story ends up on chapter three with continental climate evolution because you and I live in a continental setting. The rocks that are forming right now are those that are forming within a continental setting. So chapter one, we're gonna look at these oldest rocks. Now these oldest rocks on this map on the bottom right, they are called the Franciscan complex. Those are the ones that are kind of gray in color. We also have some of the Jurassic volcanics, and we can see those as kind of some of these pinkish coral colors within the gray. And then we also have some of these green colors here, which we call the Great Valley sequence. Those are also relatively old. So that's gonna be all part of chapter one. We wanna find how those different kinds of rocks formed in the ocean. Chapter two, we're gonna start looking at the rocks that are here in pink, the tertiary volcanics. Now tertiary is a term that we use to designate a span of time. 
And we'll also be looking at some of these Cenozoic, also a designation of time. Colors, for example, we can see some of this purple through here. And then our chapter three, which is going to look at continental evolution, is going to be only looking at the most recent, recent rocks that have formed. So let's start, of course, with chapter one. Again, we're focusing on Sonoma Mountain, and we want to see what rocks are at depth beneath Sonoma Mountain. Well, the rocks that are at depth, the oldest, the deepest rocks of the Sonoma Mountain region are all part of what we call the Franciscan complex. For those of you who are a little more versed in geology, you may have heard this referred to as the Franciscan formation. Technically, the word complex is more appropriate, but you know, formation is good enough. The Franciscan complex is quite literally a complex mixture of rocks that it created together, came together in what we consider a convergent setting. So right here, where I've drawn this red line, that is a tectonic trench. Now you've heard of trenches before, you just may not have recognized what the word means. For example, Mariana's Trench, the deepest place in the ocean, that is a tectonic trench where two plates come together and where they come together, one is drug down deep into the earth. That trench setting, that's where the rocks of the Franciscan formation accumulated, accreted between at least 180 million years ago and approximately 65 million years ago within the Sonoma mountain region. We can extend that span of time from 180 to closer to 40 million years if we look at a larger larger area, for example, the entirety of the California coastal range. That means that the convergence, two plates coming together, is a really important part of the story of the formation of Sonoma Mountain. So as we back up and we look at the tectonic setting going back 180 million years ago, and that's what this map on the upper left hand side, upper left hand corner of the screen is showing. So here we are on North America. Well, that's plate number three, continental setting. That's why I have it orange. I'm gonna stick with orange for continent and blue for marine. Then here in the middle, number two, we have the Farallon plate, plate number two. Farallon plate is an oceanic plate that for the most part has completely been subducted or recycled back into the mantle into the layers of the deeper earth. And then over here on the leftmost, westmost, we have the Pacific Plate, number one. Well, most of us are aware that the Pacific Plate is directly to the west of us today and we're standing upon the North American Plate. So what happened to the Farallon Plate? Well, 180 million years ago, there was a divergent boundary, right where I'm drawing these red lines here, where the Pacific plate and the Farallon plate were diverging or pulling apart from each other. Why do I bother even telling you this? Because the oldest, oldest, oldest rocks we have in the Franciscan complex actually formed right here from volcanic eruptions, rising from the deep earth and forming the oceanic plate. And we actually have pieces of the volcanic rocks that are the result of that volcanic process which is awesome. I love volcanoes. So that just makes me happy whenever I get to talk about volcanoes. So those rocks basically formed more or less here where I'm putting an X. We also have rocks within that 180 to 65 million year range that formed on the Farallon plate, somewhere within this span between the equatorial region of the world about 180 million years ago and our current location, which is approximately right here where I just put an X. That means that for the span of 180 to 65 million years, the rocks that we currently find beneath Sonoma Mountain formed over this huge space. They all accreted, came together, were gathered within the trench itself. Oop, there's my stars. Now that trench is shown here on this slide. In geology, when we create maps for convergence, we oftentimes will create a bold line with little teeth on it. 
and that te that little line with the teeth on it is the way that we say this is a trench or a convergent plates coming together boundary. Here we have the Farallon plate and we can see it's moving towards the North American plate convergence. And then over to the west, we have our Pacific plate and we can see it is moving away from the Farallon plate, therefore divergence. So now when we go over to this map, maybe a little easier for us to comprehend this map from 100 million years ago, we can say we are right here where I just placed this star. We're still in the ocean. The continent that you and I walk upon right now, it's not continental at all. It's actually still deep below the waves. And we can see these darker black lines that I'm tracing in red. This is the trench. So Sonoma Mountain, as we know it, did not exist 100 million years ago, but the rocks that form the base of the mountain were forming, accreting, combining together within the trench. You may have also come across the word melange. Melange is a fancy word for geologic mess because so many different rocks from such a very large area all came together at this same subduction zone and mixed together in such a mess that it's nearly impossible for us to divide it out. It's not that much different than if you were, for example, using a mixer to make cake. And so you put the flour and you put the baking soda in and you put the vanilla and you put the eggs and all that good stuff and then you push go and all of the ingredients are mixed together. And as they get all mixed together and you push stop, you know that it is now impossible to unmix those ingredients and separate them out. That's basically what happened in this trench. Everything got so mixed up that we use the word melange to say bunch of stuff all mixed together, lots and lots of variety. And um, those rocks that were sourced further west, they all moved in the eastward direction towards our present day location. So I want to give you an idea of what that trench actually looked like. So we're going to zoom in a little bit so you can see the setting, that black line that we are currently on right there, that tells us that 100 million years ago, Sonoma Mountain was deep beneath the ocean at that trench. Now that trench can also be referred to as a subduction zone. So when one plate dives beneath the next, we call it subduction. And all of the rocks that end up accumulating or accreting within that trench end up forming what we call an accretionary wedge. Because it has a wedge-like shape and is the accretion of many, many types of rock coming together, both from the ocean and also some of it washing down rivers from the continent and being combined into that melange mess. Now, these accretionary wedges, which are forming today in other locations, we can map them and we can start to understand how they actually are forming in present day situations. And then we can extrapolate that back to how the Franciscan formation, which is an accretionary wedge, how it formed. So I'm gonna start here in the bottom right. This is a simplified picture of what an accretionary wedge looks like. So here you have the trench. So you can see those two plates are coming together there. And notice that all of this rock, all of this sediment, the mud, the sand, the pieces of oceanic crust, all this kind of rock comes together. It gets folded, as in mixed over each other. That's part of what makes it a mess. There's a ton of faults that also form that allow the different parts of the rock to essentially slide past each other. And that forms this kind of undulating terrain on the ocean floor, because remember, this is still beneath the waves. So if I go over to the bottom left part of the screen, this is a what we call a bathymetric map of the Cascadian accretionary wedge. I know that was a huge math mouthful. So the word bathymetric basically is looking at elevation profiles beneath sea level. So what is the shape of the ocean floor? 
So here, I'm going to draw a line for the coastline of, this is showing the coastline of Oregon and Washington. And so what we see in color here is essentially showing us an elevation profile, elevation changes on the ocean floor. And notice that these appearance of mountains and valleys all parallel each other. That is the accretionary wedge. It's the accretionary wedge that is currently forming as a small tectonic plate that is off the coastline of Oregon and Washington is subducting underneath the North American plate and creating this accretionary wedge. This ends up fueling volcanic eruption. So as that plate subducts underneath, it gets hotter and hotter, it melts, magma begins to form and that magma begins to rise to the surface. And as it makes it to the surface, it will form volcanoes on the surface and the volcanoes that are currently active in association with this cascade range, of course, would be Mount St. Helens, or, and even if we look at Mount Shasta, Mount Lassen, Three Sisters, the Cascadian volcanoes of the Northwest. What I find interesting about this is this is just giving us a snapshot. It's saying this is what an accretionary wedge looks like. And therefore the rocks of the Franciscan complex, which is a mess of rocks from accumulated from a large area, it once looked like this. It was deep underneath the ocean. It all formed in a marine setting. So that gives us an idea of the source of the rocks from chapter one. Again, we call these the Franciscan formation. And now we need to put this, give ourselves a sense of where these rocks exist today. So this is also our transition to chapter two. I'm gonna start in the bottom right. And in the bottom right, you see the Franciscan for complex right here. I'm gonna draw the arrow that helps you understand where that is. And you can see it's kind of like this turquoise color. This is what we call a cross-section, a geologic cross-section. It's kind of like if you make a cake and then you cut that cake and now you can see the layers of the cake. That's what we're looking at. So the surface is this red line that I'm drawing here. And what we're seeing is what is beneath the surface. So here we have the turquoise rocks of the Franciscan. We see they're at depth, they're oldest. And in some places they're at the surface, so we can access them. In other places like the Sonoma Mountain region, they are under other rocks. So Sonoma Mountain would be right through here where I'm now drawing this arrow. And we know that the oldest rocks at depth are Franciscan. They formed in this accretionary wedge setting. So again, here we have Sonoma Mountain. Oops, sorry, I meant to put a little star there. So here we have Sonoma Mountain here. That means what we need to understand next is what are these gray rocks? These are called the Petaluma Formation. And even more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, what are the orange ones? Sonoma Volcanics. In geology, when we create these cross sections, and these geologic maps, as we see in the upper left, we use colors as a code for different kinds of rocks. So just think of the colors essentially color coding. So as I go to the upper left to this geologic map, we see that what's at the surface of the land, because a map will only show us surficial information, whereas our cross section will show us depth information. We see at the surface that Sonoma Mountain is made entirely of tertiary volcanics in pink. Tertiary, again, is a time designation. It basically is like me saying June. We know what June means in a calendar year. For geologists, tertiary essentially is going to mean 65 to the last couple million years. So these are relatively recent volcanic eruptions, and we need to understand when these rocks volcanically erupted whether or not we're going to have any volcanic eruptions at this location in the future, hint, we won't. And what actually caused these volcanoes to erupt in the first place? So that is what chapter two is. Chapter two is this transition from our marine setting to our continental setting. We're looking at the steps that occurred after the Franciscan formation rocks had formed in this region. And then as the ocean became more and more and more shallow, how that changed what kinds of rocks 
were forming directly on top of the Franciscan. There are two main steps to chapter two, and I'm going to start with this one. One of the things that, especially those of you who are a little bit more well-versed in the history of the Franciscan formation, you're probably looking at this going, I keep being told that the Franciscan formation is closer to 180 to 40 million years old. So why doesn't that 40 million year old age extend to Sonoma County region? It's because whole portions of the Franciscan formation have been lost to time. So you have to imagine we have this accretionary wedge, it's underneath the waves, it's at depth beneath the water. But as we see this tectonic transition start to lift that rock up, quite literally that deep accretionary wedge starts to be lifted closer and closer to sea level. And as it becomes more shallow water, the waves on the surface and the ocean currents are able to rearrange, remodel, and erode the rocks that are closer to the surface. And essentially, the whole uppermost portion of the Franciscan formation, it gets washed away. And because it gets washed away, we're essentially missing time. Based on estimates, and I have to say estimates because there's actually no way for us to be entirely sure how much rock has been lost, we estimate that over a 30 million year span of time between about 40 to 10 million years ago, about five miles of the Franciscan formation were eroded away. A five, uh, the upper five miles were lost to time. And after those upper five miles worth of rock were eroded away, then we see the younger rocks emplaced on top. So I'm going to give you kind of the snapshot of what this would have looked like over the course of time. Now, these maps are amazing. They are coming out of um, the Colorado uh, Plateau Geosystems group. They've done an amazing job of creating these tectonic maps. This one in the upper left corner is showing 60 million years ago, and the star is showing the location of Sonoma Mountain as it would have been at that point in time. So again, 60 million years ago, we're out in the ocean. We go forward in time to 50 million years ago, still out in the ocean. Notice that darker line that I'm highlighting in red, that's the trench. So this is the rocks that are accumulating in that trench. We go forward to 30 million years ago. The area we consider Sonoma Mountain is still underwater. It's still close to that trench. So we suspect the Franciscan formation was continuing to form at this point in time. We just lost that part of the record. We go forward in time to 20 million years ago. We start to see a change, a really important change here. It's still a subduction zone. You can see that darker line here and the star above it. But notice what's happening just to the south. We don't see that dark line anymore. The subduction, the convergence between two plates has ended at this point in time, south of our modern day location of Sonoma Mountain. This here that I'm drawing a red line for, that's the San Andreas Fault. So the San Andreas Fault is making its way up towards us now moving forward to 15 million years, you can see we're really close to that San Andreas Fault actually being able to make it to our current location. And by 10 million years ago, based on our ability to recreate this picture with piecemeal information, we can see that the San Andreas Fault reaches the Sonoma Mountain, Sonoma County area. So that's what chapter two is really telling us is that for about 40, 50-ish million years, we know that the Franciscan formation continued to form, but most of the uppermost rock has eroded away. And in geology, we use the term unconformity to say missing time, as in we know that things were happening, but now that time is missing. A way that I might describe this is if you had a book of course, your pages are numbered in books, they usually are. And then you just ripped out a whole section of pages. You would be able to look at that book and say, I am missing pages, but I don't know what text was on those pages. 
that's essentially what an unconformity is. It's, it's time, geologic time that we don't have a record for, but we know something was happening and we do our best to fill in those gaps with information from surrounding regions. And this is where things get really interesting because somewhere around the 10 million year mark, that's when Sonoma Mountain, Sonoma County as we know it, transitioned away from tectonic convergence, plates coming together, towards transform motion, two plates now sliding past each other. And this is why. I'm going to start in the upper left. Notice that the upper left is 30 million years ago. So we have our Pacific plate to the west, our Farallon plate sandwiched in between, and we have our North American plate to the east. And we even have those little teeth showing us where the subduction zone is. And just as the Pacific plate meets the North American plate, thereby causing the Farallon plate to be completely subducted beneath the surface of the earth, that's what the San Andreas Fault formation entails, the meeting of the Pacific plate and the North American plate. Now, I'm just going to do a quick aside to explain why this is the case. Now, the North American plate was moving more or less northwestward, close enough to it. The Pacific plate was also moving more or, west, more or less northwestward. So even though the Pacific plate comes to touch the North American plate, that Pacific plate does not subduct underneath North America because the directionality of these two plates doesn't have them squeezing towards each other completely. Instead, they come together enough that they're kind of like shoulders rubbing but then they're both moving more or less in the same direction. So think of it as like two cars on a freeway in adjacent lanes. Those two cars are both moving in the same direction. But as we don't want to do on a freeway, those two cars drift into each other and they squeeze into each other, but they're still both moving in the same direction, even as they squeeze into each other. That is what the San Andreas Fault is. Technically, the San Andreas Fault zone, it's not a single fault, but a whole compilation of faults. That fault zone is the result of the Pacific plate and the North American plate moving in more or less the same direction and squeezing together. But the Pacific plate is moving faster than the North American plate. Therefore, the relative motion is depicted within these arrows. I know that part is confusing. I am purposely going to skip forward and not go into the specifics of that because it's confusing. And so as, Nicole, yeah. Um, this is your five minute notice. Oh my, okay. So <laughs> as of 20 million years ago, we can see that the San Andreas Fault has grown longer. 10 million years ago, here we see the length of the San Andreas Fault, and we also can match that map to this picture and say, okay, we have a snapshot of what this looked like for the Sonoma Mountain region. And then here on the right, we have a map that shows the current San Andreas Fault extending all the way from the Salton Sea of California up to Point Arena. Now here's a really important part of the story that is also very confusing to a lot of people because we don't understand it very well. Part one, as these two plates are squeezing into each other, they're causing faults to form. And as those faults form, I'm trying to show you this with my, my fingers to the best of my ability, they cause some areas of rock to lift up and others to drop down, and that creates the mountain valley, mountain valley, mountain valley shape of the California coast range that you and I live in and that Sonoma Mountain is, of course, a part of. So the faulting associated with the San Andreas fault boundary is the reason the coast range exists. But there's another piece of information, part two, that's important. This transition from convergence to transform motion, at times it causes some of those faults to what we consider to dilate or to open up enough that it creates a window. We call it a slab window, not my favorite term, but we'll go with it. It creates a window through which magma from deep inside the earth can rise up through that fault and erupt onto the surface of the earth. And in the upper right portion of the screen, all of these triangles 
and this red blob here called the Sonoma Clear Lake Volcanic Area. These, volcan these are all volcanic rocks that are formed as a result of the transition from convergence to transform boundary. And the Sonoma volcanics are 10 to 2 million years old. So I'm back to our geologic map in the upper left. Notice the pink rocks are tertiary volcanic rocks. Those volcanic rocks in pink, those are the ones that erupted as a result of the San Andreas Fault forming. And here on the bottom, we have another cross section. Here's our star to say this is Sonoma Mountain. And notice it is underlain by Sonoma Volcanics. And the reason this exists as a mountain is not because it's a volcano. Sonoma Mountain is not a volcano. It is made of volcanic erupt rocks that erupted from volcanoes that no longer exist and have since been uplifted via faulting associated with the San Andreas. For a very long time, in fact, until the last million years, those volcanoes that were erupting all that rock, they were poking up out of the ocean in all the areas you and I call valleys today, they were shallow marine areas. And we see Merced formation and Petaluma formation. These are all marine rocks that formed in the valley areas. They're not technically valleys, they'd be shallow sea. And only in the last million years or so has the land, the Franciscan formation, and all the rocks atop it been lifted up high enough that we are now above sea level. That means that only the last million years of time has been continental. Everything previous to that, all the rocks that formed in Sonoma County and on Sonoma Mountain previous to that were marine. We have to consider that at the same time that the land is uplifting, technically the rock is uplifting to become land. And we have all this faulting and we have all these volcanic eruptions occurring, the sea level is also going up and down. So 5 million years ago, and yes, Nicolette, I'm going over just a little bit. 5 million years ago, sea levels were slightly higher than they are today. And we can see that sea levels have gone up and down and up and down and up and down for millions of years. But we're gonna focus on the last 22,000 years for the last couple minutes of my presentation. So in the 22, 24,000 years ago, sea levels were really low. And they were really low because most of the water within the ocean, not most of, that was incorrect, much of the water in the ocean had been locked up in ice and glaciers and therefore sea levels were lower. But we know we live in a glacial, a interglacial stage now where much of the glaciers have melted and the ice caps. There are still some, but it's just the remnants. And therefore, in the last few million years, we've been at relatively high sea levels. So not only has the rock uplifted out of the ocean, but sea levels are also going up. So that's one of the reasons understanding the history of Sonoma Mountain has been so complicated. I'm gonna go for just another minute to wrap this up. Um, Nicole, yes. um, it's okay if you go like five minutes after. Okay. That uh, sounds good. That'd be yeah. better for me. I have so much to talk about. <laughs> go for it. So for the last 25,000 years, we've essentially been transitioning into an interglacial climate. Okay, so I'm now transitioning from more of a geologic formation to looking at climactic formation. We now have a general understanding of how the rocks themselves have formed, how tectonics and fault lines have caused mountains to rise relative to the valleys. But now we wanna to start to also understand how climate has played a part in creating Sonoma Mountain as we know it today. We live in a time due to being an interglacial time of sea level rising, and it will continue to rise. I'll show you an image of that here shortly. And if we went back 25,000 years ago to when sea level was quite a bit lower, I wanna show you this map that shows all these lakes, these continental lakes. When the glaciers and the ice caps, which were much larger, there was so much more precipitation in this age region of the world that many of the valleys were in fact 
lakes, even when we think of Death Valley itself was a lake, but also the area that we call Sonoma County, it was relatively cold. We certainly did not get these kinds of heat spells that we're experiencing today. It was wet. There was a lot more precipitation and it was very, very lush. It had more of like Oregon or even parts of Alaska type climate to it. But then as we move away from the glaciation towards the interglacial climate that you and I live in today, the lakes evaporate away, temperatures go up, and precipitation decreases. And so for the last 25,000 years, this region's had decreasing precipitation. We see that here in this map. So in the bottom map, this is basically saying in color code, bottom left, this is how much precipitation used to fall in California between 1981 and 2010. But more recently, in the last few years, this is how much precipitation we've been having. And we're also seeing increasing temperatures. And if we look at the bottom right map, we can see the expansion of the color red is showing how many more areas of California are seeing increasing temperatures projected into the future, showing us the climactic warming you and I will experience. This is natural. This is aside from the anthropogenic or human caused climate change. This change to a warm and dry climate is the result of leaving the ice age and leaving the glacial age and coming into interglacial, which is why droughts and wildfires are natural for this climate. Therefore, our present environment of Sonoma Mountain, which is located right here, is a combination of the San Andreas fault motion that has created the coastal range that Sonoma Mountain is part of. In fact, this red line is showing you the breadth of the coastal range. That's what has lifted Sonoma Mountain up. We still have marine influence from the ocean. So that's part of what brings our fog in and keeps our temperatures a little lower than they might be in, for example, Sacramento. But because we are now on land and this area is no longer underwater, we're going to have a lot more extreme weather in this region. And part of that extreme weather occurs when wind moves from the continental setting and flows towards the ocean. And the reason I wanna point this out for just a moment is any gaps that we see in these mountains that move from northeast to southwest, these gaps in those mountains, that's where we end up seeing wildfire paths being so devastating. Because the San Andreas Fault, as a fault system, has created a mountain range shape that is conducive to funneling warm, hot air from the continental interior towards the ocean. And that warm, hot air, as it flows over the surface of the land, dries it out and causes what we consider to be fire weather. Then we add in our human-caused atmospheric climate change. And it, all that we as humans are doing to increase atmospheric temperatures to cause the climate to change is really just increasing the rate of change that was naturally occurring anyway. And whenever there's a faster rate of change, that's when weather gets a little, we're gonna go with exciting, but also devastating would be also a good word for this. So as we go forward over the next few years, decades, we expect more droughts, we expect more of these wind events that are associated with a combination of geologic and climatic events. And we're also going to see increasing sea levels. Therefore, we live in the land of change. Change will happen. It's just happening a little faster now than it has in the past. I would love to talk about this for hours more, but I know that I have essentially gone over my time already. And one of the things that we wanted to look at for the Center of Environmental Inquiry is what you as our participants are also interested in. This is 
what I hope was a foundational presentation to give you an idea of what created Sonoma Mountain and Sonoma County. If you liked this talk, which I hope you did, if there's other topics that you would like me to cover in the future, please let us know. I'll leave this slide up for um, the few minutes so that you're able to type into your chat box. If, for example, you would like to see presentations on natural disaster preparedness, type in the number one. If you want to see all of them, type in all. If you want to see droughts and wildfires and climate change, type in five and six. And if you have questions, um, Nicolette, now's a really good time to bring those on. Oh, great presentation. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, so yeah, um, uh, right now, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat and um, I can read them out to, to, um, to Nicole. Let's see. Okay, we got, we have one so far. Oh, oh yeah. So people are um, sharing what they're interested in. Very cool. Uh, um, uh, see, Judy Baker writes, excellent presentation. Gary wants to know about the formation of the ash layers, or ash layer. So the ash layers or volcanic ash layers are going to be part of the Sonoma volcanic rock. So when we, when we use the term Sonoma volcanics, we're essentially saying all of the volcanism that occurred between approximately 10 to 2 million years ago. The good news that I didn't get to is that volcanism is done. We are not going to have any more volcanic eruptions in Sonoma County, but bad news that volcanism is still currently occurring to the north of us in the Clear Lake region. The Clear Lake region, Mount Canocti, is a volcano. It will continue to have volcanic eruptions, and when those volcanic eruptions spew ash up into the atmosphere and it rains back down, it will form volcanic ash layers on the yeah. surface. Um, we know those kinds of Mount St. Helens types eruptions did occur in the Sonoma County area between 10 and 2 million years ago and the volcanic ash layers we have in the Sonoma Volcanics give us that data, that information about the events of the past. Oh, very interesting. Um, Kim Bartlett um, asked, is it possible to see this recording at a future date? And I will say that um, I will um, write in the post event email how to see the recording at a later date. And eventually when I have the link to that recording as well, I will be putting that up on my website, which is appreciatingearth.com. One of the pages within that website is called Earth Education. So I'll also be putting it up there. In addition to, I know um, the Center of Environmental Inquiry has been posting these up on YouTube. Very nice, okay, let's see. Um, Patty asked, do you ever teach in the Osher O-L-L-I? I don't quite know what yes. that is. But. I do teach in Ollie. In fact, I started teaching geology of the national parks this fall, and then, you know, a global pandemic occurred. And so I only made it through one lecture before we had to shut that down. And I will be teaching through Ollie um, in the future for sure. In fact, in the end of July, I can't tell you what date off the top of my head because July feels very futuristic to me right now. Um, at the end of July, I will be doing a, um, a like a one hour presentation through Ollie. So Ollie is um, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which is part of Sonoma State. It is for a crowd of lifelong students. That's very cool, very cool. Okay, uh, Marlena asked, um, uh, what is the difference between marine and continental? Um, wait, so, wait, oh, sorry. Is the, is the difference between marine and continental the reason why Katadi has clay soil and just south towards Petaluma has loam? Ooh, that's a really good question. It's very loaded, too. <laughs> um, one of the, okay, so some of the reasons we see a change in soil type from even Katadi to Petaluma does have to do with differences in underlying rocks. And then when those rocks, rocks are made out of minerals. 
when those rocks and minerals, they break down into soil, the, that is going to change the type of soil that, occur, that actually forms. So when we see different rocks in different locations, that's also going to produce different types of soil. But the reason yeah. that's also a difficult question is that part of that has to do for Katahdi, um, that the Sonoma volcanic rocks that Sonoma Mountain is made out of, there's a lot of a mineral that we call feldspar. And feldspar, when it breaks down, it breaks down into clay. And that clay then washes down the mountain via the rivers and becomes part of Katahdi Valley and therefore also part of the soils. So yes, there is a part of the reason the soils are different in those two different locations is differences in rocks, underlying rocks, but it also has to do with what ingredients for that soil are brought to that location via rivers. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to start wrapping up the meeting so we can end on time. But Nicole has very um, graciously um, um, is, uh, um, staying after the meeting so that um, the rest of the, everyone's questions can be answered. Um, let me turn the video. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to wrap it up. So um, thank you all again for attending. I hope you all learned a lot and feel empowered to use this knowledge a little more and have some fun. Um, again, please feel free to email me or Nicole or Carrie after we sign off here and I'll try to reply. This is just one, one of the many deep dive style events we've had and one of over two dozen virtual events the center has planned through June. And there are more events uh, and learning opportunities that are being added all the time. So check out our website at cei.sonoma edu to pre-register for the event. Um, feel free to spread the word um, to um, everyone that you, throughout the world that you know because um, the virtual events can be attended from anywhere. There are some specific events that are upcoming that may be of interest to um, this crowd. So next, let's see, um, on Friday, not this Friday, but next Friday, um, June 12th at 12 p.m., there's the event, Learn with a Naturalist, the value of field sketching. So you will join Christine Elder to learn to use nature sketching into field studies. Um, on Monday, June 22nd at 2 p.m., there's Learn with, Learn with a Naturalist, a video showcase exploration. You can join Suzanne DeCourcy, who will present educational videos made by the Sonoma State Naturalist. Okay, thank you all, and stay safe, So we hope to see you soon. And the people who, that, um, who can stay after um, will keep um, reading the questions. Yeah, I'm happy to continue answering questions for sure. Okay. Let's see. I'm just going to look. Go back here. Okay. So um, Deborah asked, what are the most prevalent rocks um, on the Sonoma Mountain region? Um, the most prevalent rocks for the Sonoma Mountain region are generally the Sonoma volcanics, but I could give you an entire lecture on just volcanic rocks. It would take me like four hours. But some of those rock names, should you be interested, include basalt, andesite, rhyolite, tuff, which is just another word for ash. Those would be some of the ones you would see most commonly. Um, in fact, we have all of those as part of the Sonoma Volcanics. And what makes that interesting is that if you think of Hawaii-style volcanic eruptions, that's basalt. And if you think of Mount St. Helens-style type eruptions, that's rhyolite. So that means all styles of volcanic eruptions occurred in this one region over the course of a number of millions of years. So if you could get into a time machine and go back and like see it and reverse quickly, you'd see all kinds of volcanic eruptions occurring. Oh, that's very cool. Um, if people want to um, turn on their video, you're welcome to do so now. Uh, I might, I can try and um, do that as well. Uh, but I'll keep at, um, asking the questions. So Una asks, can you please explain the location of the mouth of the Russian River as it travels north? I want to see evidence of ancient uh, mouths in Sonoma amid um, Marin County. Can you read that one more time? Yeah. 
Um, can you please explain the locations of the mouth of the Russian River as it travels north? Maybe like the connections or yeah. the... Um, okay. So the Russian River is really weird. <laughs> Russian River does not behave properly. In fact, it's a very disobedient river. There are a number of different hypotheses, and I use the word hypotheses because we can't verify them. These are just really good educational guesses. One of, I have two favorites. One of them is that the Russian River, as we know it, used to flow south through Katadi in Petaluma and out into San Pablo Bay and basically made its way along the valley. But at some point in the past, and I honestly can't tell you when because I don't know if anyone really knows this. I've seen a number, a few numbers though. At some point, the Russian River, which flows from north to south and then takes almost a 90 degree turn and goes straight west and out through the mountains. The thought is that at some point in time, the river was flowing south. Some kind of earthquake basically threw up mountains in its way so it couldn't flow south anymore. And so it was forced to find the next easiest route of flow, which happened at that point in time to be to the west and essentially rode its way, its way west to become the weird shaped river that we see today. Now, we don't know exactly when that happened. We don't know exactly what earthquake caused that. That's just the best geologic guess to say, why, why would it be so, such a misbehaving river? There is some evidence that I don't necessarily consider to be super well verified that the Russian River used to flow all the way through Petaluma. It's just all that rock is buried at depth, so it's really hard for us to find that evidence. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'm just looking for some more questions. Um, Ty has sort of a paragraph, or I'm going to read um, what they were writing. They're talking about the Franciscan complex. They were asking about different degrees of uh, metamorphism, blue schist, green schist, etc. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think that's what it is. Um, is there any unmetamorphosized Franciscan complex rock? Fitch Mountain at Healdsburg is underlaid by cobble, conglomerate. It is highly deformed, but apparently unmetamorphosed. Could mm -hmm. that be Lake Franciscan? Yes. Um, the Franciscan formation, like, or complex, is a mess. In fact, it has, there's three rock types, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. All three are present. And part of what happens, if you kind of remember the images of the wedge-like shape, is that some of those rocks of, this is gonna be the oceanic plate that is subducting. Some of those rocks get carried deeper. And as the pressure and temperature goes up, they get metamorphosed. Whereas the rocks that end up staying closer to the surface during that mixing process, they don't get buried as deep and therefore they do not get metamorphosed. They stay as their original form, which is usually sedimentary. So when we look at the Franciscan complex, one of the reasons it's complex is that the rocks within it, which of, are of great variety, that's why we call a messy melange, some of the rocks stayed surficial, some of the rocks went really deep, and some of those rocks went really deep. In fact, they went so deep that if they went any deeper, they would have melted. So the fact that they went the deepest they possibly could, and then somehow made their way back up to the surface so you and I can walk upon them is awesome. It's amazing. So we find blue schist and green schist and amphibolite. Those are all metamorphic rocks. Those all are rocks that went to great depth and then made it back up to the surface. We find sandstone and shale. Oftentimes it's called mudstone. We find those, those are sedimentary rocks. Those are some of the oceanic rocks that didn't get buried as deeply. They stayed more superficial. If they had gotten buried deeper, they might have turned into a schist. So yes, all of those, in fact, I, I could probably do a 10 day talk on the Franciscan alone and still not be able to get to all the information on it because it's a mess. And all I can say is for geologists who are doing research projects, the Franciscan is a mess. 
One of my colleagues, David Barrow, spent 20 years, I'm not exaggerating, 20 years mapping just the Tiburon Peninsula. That's it. Just that one little peninsula took 20 years. So, and that's because it's such a mess and has all the different kinds of rocks present. Well, that's amazing. That's dedication. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to um, ask another question. So, Ellie asked, was Sugarloaf Mountain and Mount St. Helena formed the same way as Sonoma Mountain? Generally, yes. Sugarloaf and um, Mount St. Helena are also, you can consider them loosely part of the Sonoma Volcanics. Some people would put them more in the Clear Lake volcanics, but honestly, I think it's all pretty much the same thing. What's interesting about St. Helena is that based on the shape of the rocks, it is what we, mm, it's what we would consider, and this is based on recent information, it is very likely what we consider a caldera complex. And essentially what that means is that at some point in time at that location, the volcano went super boom. It exploded itself so catastrophically that it literally collapsed into its own magma chamber. It was just beyond comprehension in its scale. And then all those rocks that collapsed down, they become that caldera complex. Essentially, it's a mess of fragmented rocks. And then that, so the volcano blew itself up. And then since then, the faults have lifted those rocks up to create St. Helena as a mountain today. So St. Helena is not a volcano. It is made out of rocks that formed through volcanic processes and have since been lifted up. It just, they stayed coherent enough that we can actually see a little bit of a snapshot of the history of how it formed. Wow, very cool. Um, so Ray asked, um, how does blue shift get to the surface from 10 kilometers below the surface? I love that question. That is, I think you would get a slightly different answer from any geologist you ask that question of. <laughs> it's not well agreed upon. I think that, um, again, my colleague David Barrow has done a really spectacular job of um, mapping the Tiburon Peninsula, which does have blue schist and suggesting, sci scientifically suggesting really important concepts of ways that those rocks that were once very deep got up to the surface. So let me, I'm gonna to try to simplify this just a tiny bit. So when you think of once again, making your cake batter in your mixer and you have kind of the layers of the different ingredients you put, on, put in that mixer bowl before you push go. And then you push go for like three seconds and then you stop. And some of the stuff that was at the top goes to the bottom and some of the stuff that was at the bottom that goes to the top, you can think of the trench or the creationary wedge being like that. It's like some of the stuff gets buried deep and then as a result of other things happening, it ends up making its way back up via faults. What's really interesting is that a lot of these rocks, including the blue schist and green schist are surrounded by Serpent, serpentinite, which is a very, it's not only the raw California state rock, but it's also a really interesting rock in general. It's very lubricating. It's, you can think of it as like a geologic lubricant, and it's quite possible that chunks of that blue schist basically get stuck within the serpentinite, and that's what carries it up along fault lines. But the truth is we don't actually know we don't really understand the process by which blue schist makes it to the surface. We just have our best geologic guesses of the day. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, Patty asks, do you, this might not be relatable right now, but do you ever give geology walks at the Fairfield Osborne Preserve? Um, I would be happy to in the future when we are allowed to see each other again. <laughs> um, I have done many field trips up there for some of my geology classes that I teach through the geology department. And I've, um, I'm also working towards, and as if you go onto my website, then you would see that I'm working towards offering um, 
excursions, essentially community field trips for those who are interested in the future. Um, it's a slow process of getting that going because there's a pandemic and therefore everything takes longer to get started. But that is my, my future goal is to actually be able to offer you those field trips and have you come to the outdoors so I can share what I know with you and help you identify rocks. I know identification of rocks is difficult. I saw Judy holding up a rock. I think it was tough, but it's very hard. It's very hard to identify rocks um, via the screen. You know, my Geology 303 students were really not happy that they had to do their rock identification exam via Zoom this, this last semester. So in person is easier for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds difficult. <laughs> okay, um, Patty asks, um, is there any evidence of slumping of Sonoma Mountain after the huge 1850 rain event? And some of the rocks on the west side look almost like pillow formations. Is this possible? Ooh, um, I do not know of any specific information about how the surface of Sonoma Mountain moved via landslides or slumping events after the 1850 rain event, um, which is a massive natural disaster in its own right and a really interesting thing to go into at some point in the future. So I'm not actually, I don't actually have any data specific to how Sonoma Mountain itself eroded as a result of that specific event. However, because Sonoma Mountain is mostly volcanic rocks and those volcanic rocks as noted previously have a mineral we call feldspar and feldspar breaks down into clay and clay creates a perfect wind wet surface for sliding to occur upon. If, if I were to pull up a geologic map of Sonoma Mountain and basically all of the Sonoma volcanics, it is riddled with landslides. And that's partly because of the clay that is naturally forming from the volcanic rocks. It creates a perfect circumstance for landslides to form or really to slide along those clay interfaces. I think I answered that whole question. I think I forgot the last part of the question. Okay, and on the west side looks most like pillow formations. Yes, it is quite possible to find what we call pillow basalt rocks in this region, but they would technically be part of the Franciscan formation. So pillow basalt, volcanic rock, is something that forms at a divergent boundary. So when the magma rises up through the divergent boundary where the two plates are pulling apart from each other, if that magma makes it to the surface of the plate and therefore erupts in direct contact with the oceanic water, then essentially it becomes a basically a ball of, ma of lava that chills on its exterior in contact with the water and it becomes a pillow or roundish shape and then the lava keeps coming and it busts out and creates another one. And then it busts out and creates another one. So you get these chain of pillow-like shapes. We call them pillow basalts because they look like a stack of pillows. But what they tell us is that that volcanic eruption, think Hawaii-style lava flow a volcanic eruption occurred underwater. So yes, you will find them. They're associated with the Franciscan. Okay, um, Judy asks, what is the type of rock in Nuns Canyon? I can't answer that specifically. I'd have to look at a geologic map, which I can totally do, Judy. Yeah, we can look at that geologic map. I'm like, Nuns Canyon, I can't speak to off the top of my head. Uh, you're getting quizzed. <laughs> I'm okay with okay. that. Me. <laughs> um, Pam asks, what makes the cedars so unique? Oh, that's such a good one. So the cedars, which are, um, they're essentially just north of the Russian River at the coastline, are, it's Franciscan. It's, but what, what makes it unique is that there is a lot of serpentinite. And the serpentinite, which is what I refer to as kind of like a geologic lubricant, um, it's, a, there's, it's a rock made out of serpentine minerals. There's a whole bunch of serpentine minerals. 
but that serpentinite has a lot of like chromium and magnesium and even other heavy metals that we don't find in high concentrations in most rocks. And therefore, when, the, um, when that serpentine ends up at the surface of the earth and becomes part of the soil, the soil ends up with a lot of heavy metals in it. And since there's a lot of heavy metals, then the plant life is only certain kinds of plants are going to be able to live in that kind of soil. So you end up with a very peculiar ecosystem that is derived from the, uh, the peculiar chemistry of the rocks there. It's just, there is so much serp serpentine in the cedars. It is still on my bucket list to go there, but I've read all the articles and like drooled over all the pictures because it looks spectacular. It's also very, very difficult to get there. Not only is it not publicly available to just go there, from what I've read, you need like full on four wheel drive vehicles to even get out there. So it's relatively pristine and that's another part of what makes it relatively unique. Oh, very, very interesting. I, don't, I never, I've heard of that, but I'm not so sure. Yeah. Okay, um, Una asks, um, how do we find more information about this Noma Caldera book? Is there a serious lack of um, concentrated info about the geology around here, bits and pieces, but no reliable source? I would agree entirely with that statement. Um, you know, I feel like I've spent the last 10 years of my life just fighting to find little bits of information. And one of the reasons that the Sonoma County geology information seems scattered is that there there's a lot of different terms that are used. For example, when I was doing, when I did um, Fairfield Osborne Preserve field trips, I couldn't find any information about that region by using the word Sonoma Volcanics. I had to use really, really random search terms. In fact, search terms that seemed to have no geologic relation to find the articles I needed to. So one of my goals, and it's gonna take me years, so forgive me that it's not only not available at the moment, but it's still will be in progress for many years to come, is the many articles that I have come across over the course of time, I, I intend to put on a page in my website so that that which I have found becomes available in one location for those who are interested. And again, a huge part of this is just the search terms. How are you searching for these articles? If, if you were using Sonoma Mountain as a search term, you're not going to find what you want about Fairfield Osborne Preserve. You have to use completely unrelated search terms that will make no sense if I list them off right now. Um, as far as the caldera goes, I will see if I can find that article and put it on my website, but I know I read it sometime in the last three months, and that's as far as I can remember. <laughs> Yes, it's earth.com. Uh, yeah, I just put, um, I put um, Nicole's um, website um, in the chat box. And I will also um, email everyone um, post this event with any other resources that, that you, Nicole, send me or I can find it too. So, yeah. Okay. Um, JD um, comments, um, they'd like to hear some comments on the geo geologic anomalies at Casadero. Ooh. Can you specify anomalies more? Because the Franciscan is mostly anomalies. <laughs> yeah, um, JD, if you want to unmute yourself and specify, go for it. Do you want, or you can um, put in chat later. Okay. Uh, in particular, I think you were speaking about it when you were talking about the uh, uh, the, the uh, alkaline ponds that are at the surface of the earth where the, where the uh, ocean didn't subduct but rather came up to the surface. And so there are these alkaline ponds 
which are hard to get to uh, across Austin Creek. You have to ford the creek about four or five times. But uh, just the geological formation of how that might have come to the surface rather than being subducted. Oh, good question. And I, I honestly don't think anyone really understands how, what actually happens within accretionary wedge because we know, the reason we know that rocks went to depth and came back to the surface is because we find rocks at the surface that could only have formed at depth. So we know the process had to occur, but we don't actually understand really how that process occurs. I know of at least three geologists who have three different answers and vehemently disagree with each other, as in there are, there's raised voices. There's no discussion as to who is right. They are all right as far as they're concerned and they just fight with each other about who is most right. And that's part of it is because this is a process that happens at great depth. We can't, it's, it happens also over the course of millions of years. So it's not like we can watch it remotely even happening today. All we can see are the results of it. So how does it actually come to the surface? We have hypotheses to suggest how it could come to the surface. And part of it is that serpentine that I described as the lubricant is a relatively, it is suggested, let me just put it that way. It is suggested that the density of that material at depth is such that it basically acts acts like a buoyancy factor that could help to lift those heavier blue schist and green schist rocks to the surface. So it's quite possible that it's the material that surrounds it that determines whether or not it is able to uplift or even geologically, quote unquote, float towards the surface as a result of its relative buoyancy and density. But the truth is we just, we don't know. And as far as that whole area, a lot of that Casadero area is um, also has more surficial rock layers that formed in more recent shallow marine environment. And so you kind of get this mix of different chapters of Sonoma County formation history, all kinds of jumbled and layered together in a way that's really difficult for us to not only access, but to also try to understand. It's kind of like that book that got, pages got ripped up and they're not, the pages aren't numbered. And now you're trying to put the book back together. And you're just like, I don't even know what the topic of the story was in the first place. So I don't even have a way to understand what the sequence of events should have been. <laughs> this is why I love geology because it just gets more interesting as time goes on. I don't, feel like I actually understand more. I feel like I have more information and more ways of trying to combine the information in a logical way. But I feel like I actually know less now than I did 10 years ago and am more confused. Oh, interesting. Cool. Okay. Um, so um, this might be on your website, but um, Deborah asked, um, are there any other classes that are open to the public that are maybe not related to um, Sonoma State? I mean, besides the Osher Ali one. Um, well, of course we have the Ali program. The other, I would say the Santa Rosa Mineral and Gem Society, which is our local rock club. They oftentimes do um, field trips. You can become a member of the club. And uh, that is much more of like, diehard rock hounds. They love their rocks and they go on all kinds of interesting field trips. They're not, I can't necessarily speak to the focus of the educational aspect to it in all cases, but at least you get to go out in the field and play with rocks. And that's also one of the reasons that I'm planning on providing community field trips in the future is because I know so many people talk about wanting to go learn about this and go see this. And can you come with me on this field trip? And I can, you can identify the rocks. I hear this all the time and there's just not, I don't think there, there are other classes that are currently available for that. So hopefully, you know, people want it enough that eventually that, that works out for me. Yeah, I hope that sounds fun. Okay. 
Um, Una um, comments that um, she said that um, she has recently climbed Maggie's Peak, peak south of Mount uh, Vider and saw formations that resembled pillow lava, but it was very light colored. Sounds very cool. You're welcome to comment on that if you want. Um, I can't speak to that specific location, but when it comes, so pillow lava is going to have a dark black to darkish green color to it. And part of what happens, especially if that pillow lava has been metamorphosed, if it got carried to depth before it came back up to the surface, it will cause that to become serpentinite like rock. It will transition towards being serpentine. And serpentine, serpentine minerals grade from, I've seen black, blue, greenish, light greenish. So you, you could possibly get pillow, pillow rock type formation that has changed into the metamorphic equivalent of serpentine and thereby changed color. It's also possible it's not pillow basalt, but I can't say to that specifically in, um, for example, within serpentine, it's really common to see the, the rock, the mineral talc, like talcum powder for ba baby's booties. It's kind of, it's white in color. And so it's really common to see that light colored mineral in combination with a greenish bluish mineral of serpentine and serpentine can have that kind of bulbous shape to it. And it's, it pet the rock because serpentine is like nice and smooth a good portion of the time. It's like serpent-like as in like when petting a snake, which to me is just horrific to think about, but okay, we'll go with that. Um, it can have that pillow-like shape, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's pillow basalt. But as for that specific location, I haven't been there, so I can't say that I've seen it. Okay, okay, finishing. Um, the, I love everyone's questions that keep coming. Um, Nicole, let me know when you have to go. We got some more I'm questions. Good for, I'm good for like another 20 minutes, then I have to go teach another class. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay, Kim asks, um, how did the clay aquatards form in the Sonoma Valley Basin? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, aqua so the word aquatard versus aquaclude they're basically the same thing. And you can think of them as the opposite of an aquifer. So an aquifer is a body of rock, is defined as a body of rock from which water can be usefully extracted. As in it comes, the, the definition is from a human point of view. Can we draw water out of that body of rock, pump it up to the surface from wells? An aquaclude or aquatard, which are more or less the same thing, is a body of rock from which water cannot be extracted because the water can't flow through it. So an example of a perfect aquaclude or aquatard is a clay pot. Like why would you put water in a clay vessel? Because the water can't pass through the clay vessel easily and therefore it's not going to spill through it and end up all over the floor. So what a, the aqua occludes and aquatards that we see within the valleys are essentially layers of predominantly, but not solely clay that formed between layers of rocks that might be more pebbly or sandy through which water can flow more easily. Now, the reason we might get layers that are more clay rich is could have been a change in climate that caused more clay to wash down from the mountains and fill the surface of the valley with more clay that was derived maybe from Sonoma volcanics. Um, we also know that as we go, if we look at the valley, Santa Rosa, Catati Valley, there are areas that are more than a thousand feet deep of sediment, as in sand and silt and clay, stuff that has not solidified into solid rock but is still loose. Like if you picked up pieces, it would fall through your hands. And we know that the bottommost layers of those are marine. They formed in that marine setting. And then only the topmost layers are fluvial, fancy word for river derived. And we know that over the course of time, the water fluctuated, not only in depth, but also the source of the, min of the material, the sand and such, that was filling in that valley also fluctuated. So it's quite possible those aquacludes and aquatards 
formed at times when there was just more clay being added into those bodies of water, thereby producing a layer through which water does not flow easily. Does that answer that question fully? Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Gary had previously asked a question about the Nuns Canyon rock height, and um, he, he wrote an, a new uh, comment saying that um, he is curious about the Nuns Canyon quarry. Um, I don't know if, you have, if that adds any additional information to, um, to the question, but um, if you want to comment about the Nuns Canyon quarry or maybe other quarries. Um, there, I don't know specifically the Nuns Canyon quarry. Uh, there's a lot of quarries around this region that are the rocks are quarried for a series of different reasons. It could be for the mineral content. There's arsenic in this region, and that's related to the volcanism of the past. Um, there's mercury in this region, also related to the volcanism of the past. Uh, there are areas that we have, um, we have mined specifically for the rocks for building purposes. For example, uh, pre-pavement and concrete, the, the streets of San Francisco were lined in basalt cobbles. So basalt, which is that dark volcanic rock, Hawaii style, was dug out of the earth in multiple places, including Annadale has some of these areas, and it was fashioned into these cobbles. And that's what lined the original hard streets of San Francisco. You can still see some of those in Petaluma as well. Um, there's few air, few streets off downtown Petaluma where those original cobbles are still preserved on the edges of the street. So you can kind of imagine what all the streets like driving over that would have been like all the time. But we can still see that and we know that those rocks were quarried from these local areas. We also know that other volcanic rocks have been locally quarried for building purposes. Um, and we also know that tuff, which is our volcanic ash rock, has been quarried for industrial purposes as well. Um, it can be used in filters to create filters. As far as the Nuns Canyon quarry, I am, don't specifically know what rock that is or why it would have been quarried sp specifically, but I do have a older paper that looks at the quarries of this region that I could Put, I, that I could make available via my website so you could look that up or you're also welcome to email me so I can provide that paper for you. Okay, okay, very cool. Okay, um, Anita asks, um, what are the current research projects involving the area about geology um, and what are the methods and technology most useful for these? Ooh, that's a good loaded question too. Um, I know that, well, I know that David Barrow, who was the one who mapped Tiburon Peninsula, he is currently working on Mount Tamapias. Uh, he expects that will take long enough that he is wor he's worried that he will, fin he will ever get a chance to finish it in this lifetime. <laughs> um, he's actually not a very computer tech savvy, but he's putting a lot of effort into putting his maps on to a computer program so that they are available for the future generation because he doesn't think he will actually have a, three decades to finish that, which is what he thinks will be necessary. Um, I know that Sue, one of my colleagues in the geology department has been working on hydrology, the hydrologic aspect of geology of Sonoma Mountain region. Um, a lot of those research projects have kind of been shifted towards like natural hazards in the recent years. I think you probably know why that shift has taken place. Otherwise, I know that there's a few professors out of Davis and San Francisco who are also working on the Franciscan and the local volcanics. But for the most part, geologic geologic research takes years and years and years to complete. And then we eventually get a paper out of it. So I don't actually know most of the projects that are currently happening, but I know that in five to 10 years, I will probably get papers about them. It takes time, geologic, again, million years, tiny span of time in geology. So if it takes a couple decades, we're like, oh, that's nothing. 
<laughs> Very cool. Well, okay. Um, Una comments that she wants to help um, you write a book, maybe about um, the about the um, the pillows that you're talking the salt pillows. Very cool. I love them. Um, <laughs> that's great. Well, you can you two can connect um, in by email and stuff, which will be cool. Um, she also um, comments. Um, or she's asked, "Have you heard of the website The Streetcar to Subduction?" Yes. And oh yeah. And another question is, um, "Can citizen scientists participate in any local research?" That's a great question. I'm going to have to look into the citizen science for local geology research. I am not currently aware of anything. I know that there's a number of apps for earthquakes and such that you can um, kind of contribute some data to, but it's on a much larger scale. It's not specific to the Sonoma County area. One thing for those who are still on the call is if you have a smartphone and you have not downloaded the My Shake app, you really, 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 really should. Um, it is a relatively new, as in this last year is when this app was made available to the public. And this is an early earthquake warning system app, which is why it's so important. It does not tell us that an earthquake will occur. It tells us an earthquake has already begun. And if the way sound waves and all other kind of stuff travels, if you happen to be in the right place and you get that message, you might have a few seconds to a few minutes to find shelter before the earthquake hits your location. It is the best we can do at this point in history to say an earthquake has started. We need to do our best with the minutes we have to protect ourselves, to get, you know, get out of your house, get into an open area. So it's called my shake. Um, I know that's not really citizen science, but I think it's yes. Exactly. It has that kind of turquoise color that um, Eric is holding up. I, this, I think it's so important that we have this because an earthquake will happen. I mean, the mountains exist, the valleys exist because of numerous earthquakes that have occurred in history. They are continuing to form. The earthquakes will continue to happen. This is the first time in history we can actually get some kind of warning that an earthquake is already in progress and you can take the moments you have to make good decisions. That's one of the reasons I'd love to offer a natural disasters preparedness talk to not only give you some of these, these links, but also to help you know what should you do in the event of an earthquake. Like what, what should you do first? How should you be prepared? What should you do to think about this? But I will look into the um, citizens um, science um, apps I know that was on my list. Carrie suggested I put it on my list like a month ago. It hasn't happened. It will happen eventually though. And I will put it on my website when I do. Um, sounds good. Sounds good. That's, yeah, very important. Um, okay. Um, Ellie asks, um, who funds the research in Sonoma geology? And since it's not economically interesting, that's a great question. The vast majority of my colleagues who are doing um, research, they have some kind of grants for it. There's a number of science foundations that have ground grants, but so many, so much of that money is going towards like natural hazard um, preparation and research at this point. So knowing more about earthquakes, knowing more about uh, flood events, etc. Um, but for a lot of people, like a lot of geologists who are doing research projects, they have their PhDs and their parts of universities and they're spending, not only are they teaching classes, they're also doing their research and trying to publish on the side. And that's why it takes so long for them to get information out. They're essentially using their prof prof professorial status to do the research and eventually to publish. But especially this last, I know for a fact, no one in my department got any research done this last semester because, you know, we went into education crisis mode, also known as all of your classes are going online. You have less than 10 days, go. <laughs> so um, I, that's also one of the reasons that it's so slow to get that information out there. Not only is there a lack of funding so people can really focus their, their time on their research, 
it just also just takes a lot of time to do the studies themselves. As far as tools, um, some of the new tools coming out that are so awesome are essentially using like drones to do surface mapping so that we have better better ways to infiltrate locations that we couldn't see otherwise. So there's a lot of new technology. There's a lot of satellite technology that we're using to better map the surface of the earth and understand geology. But part of what we're recognizing through these studies is it does not replace boots on the ground. We need to physically go see the rocks and see the cliffs and do the mapping in person to get the fine details. Because a drone cannot fly up to a a cliff and take a sample and yes i'm a geologist we lick our rocks we can't help ourselves and like taste the rock and find out if it has silt or sand or clay to actually really know what that rock is made out of so the technology that we are deriving is supplemental to the field research that is still required okay very interesting okay um sarah reed um comments um she said, so a great place to view layers um, up close are the cliffs at Point Arena Pier. She uh, advises to walk out on the pier and look back at the cliff. They're so okay. beautiful. <laughs> I remember the first time I went to Point Arena. I'm a geologist, so I was freaking out about how excited I was that I was on like the northernmost extent of the San Andreas Fault. I'm like, this is the end of the fault. It was just so exciting, but part of the reason those cliffs are lifted is because as that fault forms, it squeezes and lifts the land. So we get to see rock that was very recently beneath the ocean, that is only very recently within the last few thousand years, <clears throat> lifted up so that we can see the edges and we can see what it's made out of. Wow, I think we'll have to go there sometime. Okay, um, Ty, um... They put a link to to the discussion of the St. Helena Volcanic Complex, and um, they also commented that the intercaldera rock rocks apparently include collapsed uh, breccias, and both welded and non-welded tusks would be a fun great would be fun great to see if um, exposed. I agree. <clears throat> um, I haven't actually gone to Mount St. Helena in person since those that research came out which for me it'll be really exciting to finally go there with that research about the caldera complex and the rocks and be able to view it from a from that new knowledge um but a lot of this information i've only recently found so i think it'll be really exciting maybe a future field trip will be focused on that Oh, cool. Okay. Um, Puzo asks, um, are there any known gold, silver, platinum, or other metal deposits in Sonoma County? Um, ooh, also another loaded question. Um, I'm going to generally say no, because I don't want you to go out and get really excited about finding gold and silver. The vast majority of the gold and silver in California are going to be found more in relation to the Sierra Nevadas. And that's because um, gold and silver and other metals are concentrated around volcanic, um, underground volcanic processes like underground magma chambers. And the Sierra Nevadas is quite literally a giant ancient magma chamber. So we're going to find lots of gold and silver through there. However, gold, silver, chromium, magnesium, iron, it is also concentrated at divergent boundaries. So where the two plates pull apart and the magma comes up and creates, for example, the pillow basalts. And since we have some of those rocks that formed at an ancient divergent boundary 180 to 160 million years ago, and then made its way to North America, became part of the accretionary wedge, those older divergent boundary derived rocks that are the Jurassic volcanics that are within the Franciscan complex, those can have concentrations of metals within them. But they can also, because those metals tend, tend towards softness, they can also be washed away pretty easily. 
you are more likely to find mercury and arsenic based on it, the mercury and arsenic is derived from the volcanism associated with the Sonoma volcanics. So, okay, aside on this whole gold and silver, the gold and silver. So if you imagine a volcanic system, so you have the magma chamber down here and the volcano itself up here. That means it's hotter down here and it's relatively cooler up here. And as some of those metals are moved through fluids, they start to rise towards the surface but some of them are going to cool and solidify closer to the magma chamber. Others are going to be able to make it further up towards the surface before they solidify and they're gonna be closer to the surface. So mercury and arsenic, they end up closer to the surface. That's why we have access to them. But the gold and silver that we suspect must be part of the Sonoma Volcanics is still buried miles, miles deep. So kind of that weird aside to that question is, yes, there is gold and silver. Is it accessible for the most part? No. Okay, very interesting. Okay, um, we have, we have um, many people are saying thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm glad you're enjoying um, it. Patty is worried about um, JD and that the bear is getting closer, but <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, everyone's saying thank you. And um, JD um, commented that there's a great book, um, which is called Ancient Landscapes of the Col Colorado Plateau by Blakey and Rennie. Mm -hmm. cool. um, oh, and Eric, uh, okay, this might be the last question because we have to wrap up soon, but okay. Are there, um, the last question um, is by Eric, and are there remnants of the Great Valley sequence in Sonoma County? Yes, there are. Um, so on the geologic map that I showed with like the pink was the Sonoma Volcanics, the Green Valley sequence was in green. And it's found mostly to the east side. And um, I know Tilo was on here. He's not on here anymore. It is so complicated to understand the relationship between the Franciscan and the Great Valley as it is today. Because what you want to imagine is that the Franciscan complex that formed in that accretionary wedge, so it's slightly to the west. And then if we went towards the Sierra Nevadas, the Great Valley sequence was essentially forming adjacent to, right next to and parallel to the Franciscan formation. Then the Sierra Nevada vol volcanoes were over here. Now, that would be nice and simple if everything just like stayed place, but then the San Andreas Fault came in and pfft, just moved everything. So this Central Valley sequence and the Franciscan basically got mixed together and pulled apart in multiple directions, which is why you, when you look at a map, you're like, why is it all scattered? Like, why is it stretched and why is it well organized? Well, it used to be well organized. And then the San Andreas fault system messed everything up because, you know, things weren't complicated enough with it being a creationary wedge melange mess, then you have to have a tectonic boundary. Here's how I imagine it. Not only have you created your cake batter and you put chocolate chips in it because that's how you should do it, but now you wanna take forks and you're just going to rip through all of that cake batter that you made and you're gonna pull it apart and it's gonna be a mess, even bigger mess than it was before. So hopefully that answers the question as to where that Great Valley sequence is and why it's why you're confused. I know Tilo is very confused. He and I were emailing about it this week. Mm -hmm. There's a great field trip location for that one, though. Well, I'm so glad that you guys have enjoyed this. Thank you for fantastic questions. And there will be future talks for sure. And I will definitely be building up on building up that Sonoma County website and offering information and letting you know. So if you become part of my newsletter, you'll you'll get the heads up when future field trips eventually begin. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Nicole, and thank everyone for attending. Hope to see you at another event. Thank you. That so was awesome. Thank you. So glad. And my curtain didn't fall down behind me. <laughs> It's miraculous. <laughs>